All right, Taylor, this is a long time coming, my friend. I've seen you come from the bottom all the way to the top in like three years. So it's exciting. Right. To see, and uh, I'm really looking forward to sharing your story with our listeners. So this can inspire a lot of people. So I know you pretty well. So, you know, obviously for the people who don't know you, who are you? Where do you live? And what were you doing before you got into real estate? Yeah, thanks, Greg, for having me. I'm super pumped. Yeah, we've gotten to know each other pretty well over the last two, three years. So Taylor Berg, live here in Poughkeepsie, New York. That's the Mid-Hudson Valley area, same neck of the woods that you grew up in. And I've been, I've been in New York for just over four years. So I came here when I was a union tradesman and you can kind of bounce all over and travel for work at different locals is what they call it. So I was working at a power plant here in Dutchess County and wasn't planning on staying, but I really like New York and the money was better. Uh, I came from Michigan, born and raised. So I came out here and I kind of liked it. And yeah, that's right. Yep. Yep. yep the mitten. And so I ended up switching my book. So I was like permanently here and transferred to the local out of the New York City, 740. And I just newly married and then we decided to get debt free. We had like 110,000 in debt and we decided to do the whole Dave Ramsey thing. And we just crushed all our debt. We lived in a studio apartment, no kids or anything like that. And we crushed it in one year. And so that's I was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we lived on like beans and rice. And then it'd be like an hour drive to work. So... I would be listening to podcasts and then the algorithm would kind of, it was just shifting to a little bit more real estate. And I heard about wholesaling and I was literally hypnotized by it. Like I could not stop thinking about it, learning about it. All the different guys, Jerry Norton, Brent Daniels. And I ended up joining Brent Daniels TTP mentorship almost right away. So that was in the beginning, right when COVID started. So it was March, 2020 is when I learned about wholesaling and it didn't take long before I started taking action. I didn't get any traction for a while, but that's when I started getting hooked. Yeah. I mean, I remember you, I think you called my website because I, you know, I've had a pretty good website ranking in New York forever. And I remember you called me and I did that same thing when I was starting like you and you just seem different on the phone. Like a lot of people call and, you know, normally I don't even answer or I personally will not answer now. So I'll get the message forwarded to me from Ryan, but I answered and I spoke to you and you seemed like, you know, you're really serious about it. Like you seem very serious about everything, your demeanor and your tone, like you just really seem serious and committed. So I remember we spoke for a couple of minutes and, you know, you, you were smart in your journey because not only did you get good mentoring from Brent Daniels, who's got a very good track record on success with students and himself, but you reached out to me and obviously gave you some good advice and, and you were able to act on it. So like, let's just get into the beginning part. And I remember I would tell you like, dude, it's not easy. Like, especially in New York, it's a hard market. And it's not because there's a lot of competition. It's because the attorneys and the sellers, and it's just a different kind of, we talked about this on Steve's podcast the other day, like how hard it is in New York with all the stuff that's not normal about real estate compared to the rest of the country. So like, what was like the path to your first deal? Let's just get, let's just get to that. Because obviously, you know, you did a deal fairly quickly from New York standards, but what was the path that you took to get to that first deal? Because it's super hard to do that in New York. I agree. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, you make a couple of good points. So I got Mojo Dialer. I started cold calling and I didn't have any money. And one thing I didn't do is I never went into any debt, no credit cards or anything because I was so fresh to the being debt free. So I just pulled an absentee owner list. And I think even before I called you, I called Devin and yep. I called a bandit sign and I said, Hey, I'll put up your bandit signs. If you can show me what you do and how you do it. So I got a lead and I got scared and I'm like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. I don't have an attorney. I don't have buy. I don't have anything. So I called Devin and he's like, yeah, well send me photos. And I gave him what the price that they said. And the photos is like, that's actually not bad. And so we went there and we ended up doing a deal. It took a long time for that one. It closed that Middle town? It was. Yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah, that. West Main Street. Yeah. Yeah. Huge old Victorian house. Yeah. I remember that so, one. Yeah. So I caught the wife on the way home. And she's like, don't talk to my husband. I'm the one to deal with. And then she stopped calling me. So I was calling the other numbers. I got a hold of him. He's like, yeah, I really want to sell. My wife doesn't really want to sell that much. And so from then I was talking to the husband and and we ended up just meeting up and he wanted to sell and not. Uh, 
I'm not sure if he was really talking to anybody else, but I was really eager. So I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just asked Devin every step of the way. And it ended up me and him split it. We got like 13.5 each. So it wasn't bad for the first one. That's a great, that's a $26,000 spread on your first deal. I mean, in New York, that's normal because it's so expensive. So like that is a normal wholesale fee. But for a new person who's never done a deal and probably never made money on their own before, getting a lump sum of cash of 13 grand is certainly nothing to sneeze over. So the question is really like, how come you were able to do this when so many other people just, they want to learn, it's easy to learn, but then they just don't take action. Like, why were you able to do that and persist? Because obviously you had help with Devin and me, and it's obviously, you know, smart of you to reach out for help. But how come you were just so persistent with this? Because a lot of people, they love listening to podcasts because it feels good. But the truth is you need to go out and get leads and talk to owners and make offers. And that's really what makes the money. I hear you. Yeah, you're right. And that was a struggle too, because it's easy to consume podcasts and YouTube all day and think that you feel like you're doing something. And I did a lot of that too. And I'm not sure what the difference was other than I just had this deep desire that I felt like once I heard about it, I was going to do it. I was going to be successful no matter what. And the deal almost felt apart a few times. And I remember, you know, calling Devin and saying, there's no way I'm going to let this thing fall. I didn't know what to do or, you know, there was issues. And I just was committed 100%. I wasn't interested. I was committed. And for something, it was just deep inside of me where I just, I had to do it. I needed to do it. It just was for me. And I just knew it the whole time. So no matter what, I was going to just bust through the wall and bust through the wall. And so I chose cold calling and it was always a struggle to get the contact rate, to refresh the list, format the spreadsheets, skip trace, find the right ones, the caller IDs from getting spam. It's always been a pain in the butt and it's always been an upward battle and it still is. You know, I have a better handle on it, but I was always just busting through walls and I never, I just never gave up. I remember cold calling for so long. I was so tired, but I was cold calling eight to 10 hours a day sometimes laying on the couch with a laptop on my chest and my, and my uh, headset on just emptying the clip every day. The thing is that people need to hear this. (laughs) Even if you're advanced and you're, you know, sophisticated investor, like you got to go back to when you started and obviously you're probably doing something similar to what Taylor's done. And that's how he started. So that is the key here for the new investors. And it's the reminder for the experienced investors. It's like, listen, you have to go in committed, not interested. I remember reading a great book called The Millionaire Fastlane back when I got started. And he said, successful people are committed. They're not interested. Mm -hmm. Interested reads the book. Commitment applies the book 10 times over. Mm, That's great. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. And that's what it takes, especially in New York, where it's a difficult market. And we obviously have a whole podcast we've produced in the past that teaches how to do it in New York for free. So let's actually go into like the teaching topic of today's podcast, because you are an expert in cold calling at this point, because you've been doing it for almost four years. So I'm going to just like almost pretend like I'm sitting down with you for lunch and I'm like, hey, I want to become amazing at cold calling. And I want, I'm going to ask you some fucking very detailed questions that I know you you know know the answers to. So let me just give you the broad overview, because I want to tell people before we get into it, you have been able to actually systematize and scale cold calling in one of the most difficult markets in America, in the Hudson Valley, Westchester area. People are, you know, they're very like skeptical, right? And I said this on Steve's podcast, like people in New York are skeptical about things. Like it's not like in Alabama, like people just answer the phone because they're nice. New York is the complete opposite. So let's get into the numbers with cold calling. Let's just start with that. And then we'll kind of unpack it from there. So let's say we have a list. All right. Let's just say we have an absentee owner list of 20,000 people in a major market, Hudson Valley, Dallas, Las Vegas, doesn't matter, Washington, Seattle, Washington, 20,000 people. That's our list of prospects for now. We're probably going to start with that, right? That's a big enough sample size. How Mm. long can we use that same list for until we have to recycle that list because we're going to tap it out? Like, What is your opinion on that? So one to full-time cold caller, if you're calling 40 hours a week, you need 10,000 records for one month of calling. So that would last two months. You need 10,000 records. Okay. So here's mm-hmm. my question on that. And this is where like, I'm the student and you're the teacher. Mm-hmm. If you pull an absentee owner list in the Hudson Valley of 10,000, that's easily there, right? Mm-hmm. If you refresh that list, like how many more people are going to be on that list that, that wouldn't have already been on that list before? That's where I'm like, like, how does the data doesn't update that much? It's not like it's a foreclosure record where there's new ones every day. That's right. That's been a big struggle for me too, because it's kind of a small market. Yeah. So terrible. basically you're going to contact... Your contact rate's going to, you're going to shoot for like 10%. So that means that for the listener, if you make a hundred calls, 10 people are going to say hello. So say you call the absentee owner list for two months, then you're going to have to broaden your list a little bit, either broaden the market a little bit, do the whole county, or you're going to have to loosen up on the filters a little bit. 
for, you know, how long they've owned the property. Maybe, you're, you know, you want somebody who's only owned the property for 20 years, but you run out of data. So now you're going to scale back to people who've owned the house for only five years. So the list, it's not going to be as good. The broader you go, you know, the tighter those filters are, the smaller the list is, but the better the list is. Okay. So we start with the list, 20,000 people. We're going to assume mm -hmm. a 10% contact rate is reasonable. We would assume mm -hmm. that's reasonable. We're 10%, mm -hmm. one out of 10 people will answer the phone. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say we have this contact rate, all right? So we have 20,000 people, 200 answer. Out of the 200 people who say hello, how many of those people are actual, I'll get an offer on my house lead? Doesn't have to be like spread my cheeks and take it up the ass lead, but I'm talking like, I'd like to consider an offer for my house because that's where I'm looking for here. Yeah, and, and leads are, it's gray. It is different very people, gray. It's so gray. But one thing that is not gray, that's completely black and white, is a contact. And a contact is when you ask a homeowner if they want to sell. That's a contact. So basically, if you're doing a full day of calling, a good day of calling is 100 contacts. Out of that, if you get, you know, leads are gray. So anywhere from two to five is really high. Two to five so. leads out of 100 contacts. Yep. That's good though. I mean, I look at it like, cause think about it. I get calls and texts and whatever for other things, not real estate. Yeah. I don't answer the phone or if I answer, I hang up yeah. or say, Hey, I'm not, I usually say, Hey, I'm not interested. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I'm pretty nice in general. I'm not like, don't call me again. But if you're going to get a hundred contacts a day, that's a great number to optimize for. And I wanted to make this a really tactical podcast. If you can get two to three leads out of a hundred contacts, they might not be the best leads, but obviously, as Gary Keller says, the quality of the leads is in the quantity of leads, a.k.a. you need a lot of mm. leads, good leads. You know, if you're getting two to three leads a day consistently, those are two or three people that you obviously can follow up with. And then obviously, you know, there's the momentum starts to build from there. Mm -hmm. So that's the main thing that someone probably wants to optimize for is like, how many dials a day do we need to make in order to get two to three leads? And in this case, if you're getting 100 contacts a day, they're spending eight hours a day calling 10,000 records. Is that correct? That's right. And it's about, so I always upload three phone numbers per record. Yeah. So, so per homeowner, three phone numbers. And so it's pretty easy math. In eight hours, you're gonna make about a thousand calls. Okay. You're gonna make about a hundred contacts and you're gonna get three leads per day. Okay. And when I was doing it on my own, because you'll always be better than a virtual assistant. Sure. When I was doing it on my own, I had one deal per thousand contacts. That's incredible. And now it's about three times that with a good cold caller slash lead manager. That's amazing. So we have a thousand mm -hmm. contacts to one deal. Yes. That's See, that's really good because you can... Well, obviously it's not scalable if it's you, which you've outsourced now, but like, that means, you know, like, as long as I get my thousand contacts, I'm going to buy a house because out of those thousand contacts, we're going to get, you know, however many leads. It's like, that's how you get consistency on a monthly basis, which you have obviously done. So this is very interesting because I've seen you on the cold calling journey. You've never had an issue taking action. You never had an issue with doing the work. Now you've obviously scaled and systematized this to where you have other people now making calls on your behalf. So what does your setup mm -hmm. look like now with your cold calling operation? So it's changed. So earlier on in the summer, I took another mentorship and I ended up scaling without kind of being ready. So I ended up at one point I had five cold callers. So we went into, for the first time, went into Westchester and Queens and, you know, areas I wasn't really familiar with. We even tried North Carolina for a moment, but it was just too much to train and I didn't have enough things dialed in. So now I'm scaled all the way back. So I did everything myself for the first year and a half. Now I got my first cold caller, Karen, and she's still with me and she's my lead manager. And I've been training her the whole time. So she's solid. She's a soldier. And now I have a part-time admin. So my cold caller slash lead manager, she calls eight hours a day and then she does the follow-up as well. And so that's what my team is. And my admin does admin stuff, but she's also there to help with all the lead generation stuff, with all the list pulling, formatting the list, refreshing the list, all that kind of stuff. So her job is kind of back end lead gen. It's back end lead gen. Now, with, with mm -hmm. that being said, now you have this cold calling systematized now, even though it's just one person, that's still not you. Mm -hmm. You're obviously negotiating, buying houses, going on appointments, all that kind of stuff. So now with that cold caller, they're calling eight hours a day. They're calling, what, a thousand records a day, basically a thousand prospects a day. They're going to hopefully get a hundred contacts and get you two to four leads or whatever. Now, are you running into an issue where like, let's say, you know, you're in Orange, Duchess, Rockland, Westchester, 
Ulster Valley, basically. Putnam, small county, pretty popular though. Now, are you just going broad with your lists? Because at that point, I feel like with niche lists, you would burn through a niche list in a week. Like it's a niche list. It's not, there's not many people on it, but you want good people on it. That's right. And it's tough because really, if you think about it, say I buy a million records, I'm only going to contact 10 to 12% of them. Yeah. So I'm not really good with spreadsheets and refreshing the day. It's always stressed me out and zapped my energy. So that's why I got the the admin and she helped with that. But basically what I do, to be completely honest, is I call through them and we just squeeze the juice out of the list as much as we can. We'll let it sit for six months and we'll go back and call it again. There's yeah. different filters on the dialers that you can use, like haven't ever contacted. You can call them that have never been contacted. Call them that you've only attempted once or twice. You can squeeze the juice out of the list as much as you can. And then at that point, I'll delete everything and I'll start fresh and I'll just re-skip trace everything. I'm changing my phone numbers. Because people are expecting their doctor to call. And so they'll answer it who never usually answer. Or they're expecting, you know, something happens where they change their number or I'm calling from a different number and they think it's somebody else. So I'm going to contact a bunch of the same people, but I don't care because you have to be pretty assertive and aggressive. And who cares if, you know, yeah, yeah I already told you, you I want to stop. Who cares? Okay, sorry. So yeah, what, my bad. So these dialers are able to track all this. What is the dialer that you prefer? So I started with Mojo and then I was cheap and I wasn't making a ton of money my first year. So I went to Zen Call and that one had up to 10 lines and Mojo is only a triple line. You can have a, actually a 12 line, I believe. And so I'm like, screw it. I don't want to skip trace anymore because skip tracing is kind of expensive. I'm going to just run through the same list as many times as I want. I'll just crank up the dialer. But that fries your caller IDs and spams them all. So I learned that and the algorithm wasn't great. So I went back recently to Mojo and, and I really love Mojo. Mojo is solid. It's simple. It's simple yeah. and effective. So you're using Mojo. Now, with your cold callers now, and then we'll get into big deals. Obviously, anyone who gets a cold call is a little skeptical. That's the reality. Are they just basically saying, hey, I'm, you know, XYZ, I'm reaching out to see if you'd ever consider an offer on 123 Main Street. And then if they say yes, they're just going to not be crazy with qualifying, push it into Podio, and then it gets sorted out. Yeah. So it's evolved, obviously, you know, throughout the years. And I've been spending a lot of time training my lead manager slash cold caller, and I've gotten better through this time too. And so it's been evolving and changing. So basically my cold caller, she's pretty good at like reading between the lines, you know, and so we'll capture anything and we'll put it into the CRM. And then we, on Monday mornings, when we do our KPI meetings, we'll go through all of the hot and warm leads and just kind of go through like, okay, why is this here? What's going on with them? Yeah. Okay. You know, time. So it's condition, timeline, motivation, price. And then I always, now I say there's a fifth one, which is vision. Do they have a vision of where they're going to go or what the next step is or actually selling? Or are they just saying, yeah, we want to move down South after I retire or yeah, it'd be nice to sell. So that vision. So I basically, now we have a, process where we say what's going on with their situation why would they sell to us rather than a realtor and what the lead status is and so that's going to condition timeline motivation price and then what the lead status is you know cold warm or hot and then why is it that lead status so we have to justify it and because you know like brent says all the times bad leads hide good leads so the trash can is your best friend so we'll go through get your, rid of them. Is your best friend i love that yeah so, so that's kind of our process and so she'll warm them up you know maybe they're going to be ready in six months or maybe you know god forbid her husband went in the hospital and they can't they don't want to talk about it right now they don't know what's going to happen okay well we're going to follow up and and see what's going on you know or somebody's retiring okay well it's easy for people to say I can't talk now, or I'm not sure it's going to be next year. Well, hold yeah. on a minute. I'm not, you know, let's really see what's going on. Let's really qualify this person so we know where to put them. That's yeah. been really big. That's a good point you just made. We qualify them so we know where to put them, right? If they're a cold follow-up, they're a cold follow-up. And that's cool. You have automation for that. But if they're like an Artie, for example, a deal we did, he didn't sell his house for a year or didn't close for a year. He had a reason. He had condition. He certainly had a price. But he had a weird timeline. And obviously mm -hmm. we waited and made 50 grand. So I wasn't crying over that. Mm -hmm. You know, when, <laughs> when people don't have a process for handling leads, they just mm -hmm. don't know what clarity is. They don't have clarity. They don't understand that process. So like in this example, like I'm just using an example of a deal that Taylor and I did last year. It was like the seller had, I mean, long story short, 
He had a house that was in complete squalor. It was a half hoarded house. He had a reason he couldn't afford it. And he literally needed to get out of there because his health was terrible. He had a price, which was 150,000 because he thought it was terrible, which it was, but that price was still incredible. And we didn't have mm-hmm. to cheat that thing. But his timeline was off. He like didn't know how to move. His daughter was like building a suite in the basement and that took like a year. So his price was off. Oh, yeah. The other three. <laughs> so it was like, lead, and it resulted in a great deal. But you know, you got to have a yeah. process. For that. That's the takeaway for the listeners. So let's get into big deals because I, I use that Artie story as an example. You and I had a phone call and we were just talking and I was just telling you like, you know, like, yeah, it's like the same effort to make 50 that it is to make 10. And you're going to obviously make an extra 40 grand and it's the same shit. So like, what was your evolution? Like, tell me your journey, because obviously you've always been good at getting leads. That's something that you you know had a knack for. But like, how did you evolve from just getting good at getting leads to like becoming a real wholesaler, making real money? Because that's what you've obviously done now. Yeah, that's a big difference, too. In my first year, I did some small ones, real small ones. And that's before I was really, you know, getting to know you. And just so everybody knows, too. When you're starting out, when I was starting out, I didn't have any confidence. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, like I didn't have any confidence in negotiating. I didn't know the market. I didn't know if it was a good price. So it was scary to give somebody a commitment because I felt like if I give them my word and then I have to back out, like, oh, it hurt so bad. Just, it, yeah. it sucked. That's you know, you're still a good <laughs> it, it, Yeah, you're right. And so I always struggled with that. And so I would put it off and put it off. And so for anybody starting out, like I had this conversation with you a few times, you know, I JV'd with you on a lot of deals, you know, for like a year and a half. And it's okay. Like you need that. Some people need, most people need that. I don't know anybody who just like jumps right into it. And and maybe there are a couple people that can do that, but you know, you really need to squat up with people who know what they're doing because, you know, Greg, Greg really gave me the, the confidence. You gave me the ability to to know how to negotiate with, well, the seller, but to turn into these big deals like we're talking about now, they're different types of people. It's lambs and sharks, you know, the the, the buyers are the sharks. And and I was still like a little lamb and they, they were going to eat me alive and they, and they were. And so, so having Greg, and by the way, too, when I met you, Greg, I thought you were 10 years older than me. You're like 10 years younger than me. I know. (laughs) Yeah, I similar. look older now. I used to look young, but now I got like wrinkles and bags under my eyes. <laughs> no, you look good. And so the big thing, you know, just it's two businesses though. Getting a house under contract is like the first business and then selling it's like the second business. So true. So I was more comfortable like lead generating and stuff like that. But I was, I didn't want anything to do with the dispo side. So you came in there and I saw the way you negotiated, you know, we were on the phone together with everybody, you know, I was just sitting there silent and listening and picking up on everything. And just, we did a couple, well, we did Lori Lane. We did, that was I like think that was the five. breakthrough for you when you saw that deal go down, when we had, I, yeah, let, me, right. let me share that. Let me share yeah. that. This, <laughs> is right. this is a great lesson for people. So Taylor brought a house to me and he wanted to partner on it. So I was like, yeah, that's a great, like the numbers, he was great at getting the deal. Like, you know, the seller had a great price and he locked it up and that was easy peasy. But then I, I knew that we had a really, really good deal on our hands and it was at a great location in Poughkeepsie and it was just a great, great deal. And I knew that because I have, you know, and Taylor has a great buyer's list now, but you know, at the time I had like probably the best buyer's list in the area, you know, for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Mm -hmm, when I put out the deal, I put it out on, and I learned this from other people. It's not like I made this up myself, but I've, I've learned from others who are more successful than me, like how to do this. So I put out the property, I offered it out to the public basically. And I said, you know, I'm pricing this low on purpose because there's going to be high demand and it's going to be highest and best. And when you do that, you know, the fear with a wholesaler or a new wholesaler is like, I'm going to piss my buyers off. And like, mm-hmm. that is, what it is. You're, you're not pissing them off. You might piss them off for five minutes, but the next week when you have another deal, they're going to be calling you because they want to make money. So that's the truth. <laughs> so, yeah, that is the truth. so I put out the house, I put it out at a low number on purpose. I got like 20 people who were interested because the numbers made a complete ton of sense. And I told all the buyers, I said, listen, you know, we have a, a hot property on our hands. There's one house and there's 20 buyers. So if you were in my shoes, you'd obviously do the same thing. So we we scheduled an open house for the buyers to walk the asset. And I think like 10 people showed up or something like there was a lot of people there. And mm-hmm. at the end, I said, Taylor, just go to the house and make sure no one does anything weird. When they're done, just 
they're all going to call me or text me or whatever. And I have everybody in a spreadsheet. I'm like, who reached out? Like, I still do this to this day with deals. Like I have a system for selling houses and you know, the 10 people who went were like, where do I got to be at? How do I get this house? And I'm like, listen, this is going to be highest and best. And I like the 10 turned into like four. And then the four were like, where do I need to be at? And I'm like, listen, this is like where you're probably going to have to be at, but I can't say this is going to get you the house because I'm just going to literally sell for the most money. That's it. Like there's so much demand for this property. So we ended up getting a buyer to go like all the way up. And I think we made like, I don't know, $60,000 on that house or something like that, that we split 50, 50. So 30,000 each. It was, so, it was a big spread. And you know, the deal on the surface, if I were to not do that, would have made us about 30,000. But instead of settling for 30,000, we doubled our profit with a tad bit more effort because we knew we had the asset that people wanted and people knew that there was a scarce opportunity. Therefore, they paid more money because ultimately the guy who bought it made money on it too. Like we didn't sell him a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. But because we were able to force that demand and create that scarcity, we were able to literally turn our profit into double because of strategy that was executed well. So that's the difference between making 30 grand on one house or making 60 on the same house with basically a smidge more effort. And that's what really changes your financial situation for the year. Because if you mm. were going to make 30, but now you made 60, now you just made double the deal size on the same deal. Therefore, that is pure net profit going into your bank account. It's not like it's you have to take on more costs or your cost of goods is going up or the rehabs over budget. Like, you're literally making double the income on the same house, which if you stack that up and do that three or four times extra on the year, you're going to put another you know, 100K in your bank and you didn't have to work that hard for it. I couldn't agree with you more. And you said it perfectly. And I think what you said without saying it is what you taught me too is transparency. Be it and just hit them right between the eyes and tell them what's going on. Be honest. I started doing that with my sellers too, but especially with the buyers. And after that Lori Lane deal that we did, my mind was blown. I'm like, wow. So this is how you do it. This is how you control these guys. And especially without me having a good buyers list, I could have made, you know, I probably could have wholesaled it myself, but a shark would have, you know, one of the buyers would have, would have gotten me down pretty low. So I, I went on after that to wholesale my first one. Actually, it was my second one on my own, which was a forty thousand dollar deal in Poughkeepsie, and then another one, a condo, fifty thousand dollars right after that. And I'm like, whoa, like okay, I just got hooked at that point. And you saw it. You saw it happen, and you were like, wow, this is yeah. possible. And then you, yeah. you saw the process and you're like, this is not that hard. It's just got to, you know, it's a negotiation at that point. And I would still come to you for with the tricky deals and the hairy deals and the ones that, you know, I needed somebody with more experience and things like that. So we still did some after that. Oh, yeah. And, and one thing, too, when you're cold calling, you're calling a lot of absentee owners and a lot of them end up being cash buyers. So that's how I ended up getting a big cash buyers list myself that is you know, pretty organic and that not a lot of other people have those lists. So that's how I got a lot of my buyers, too. And one other thing that I want to mention about getting these big deals is when I started wholesaling in real estate and I just heard about it, I never did sales or marketing or real estate ever before. Never even thought about it really. And I never read a self-help book. I only probably read a couple of books in my whole life. I never thought about, you know, self-development or living intentionally. Really, I was kind of just in the moment, really fear-based scarcity mindset. It's a mountain you got to climb. But I remember, you know, hearing all these people like, you got to read books, self-development. And I'm like, yeah, but that seems like, like so much. And I, I, you know, I just, and then it's like, it's not an option. You have to, like, you can't get success. You know, being a business owner, an entrepreneur is the ultimate self-development journey. And so without that, yeah, there's no way. So, you know, riding on the shoulders of giants, you know, like Brett Daniels helped me, you know, and, and but you were the one in the trenches with me and, and that's giving me the confidence in, in the learning. You know, I, I was doing everything in person with you, but it, yeah, so that just all kind of helped and there's no going around it. You got to be so in self-development. Your level of income is direct proportion to your level of self-development. You know, and then it could be reading books, it could be podcasts, it could be coaching, it could be videos like YouTube videos, whatever. But you got to raise your education level to then have that education turn into insight, which would then lead to intentional action, right? So that's that's a critical thing. I see a lot of wholesalers, they think, and at least this was my problem all those years ago, which is crazy to say, is like, if you start out and you've never made money before, 
what makes you think the next year you're going to make 200 grand if you have no business experience? So it is a journey. It takes time. It takes lessons. It takes a lot of action. It takes a lot of persistence. Like you have to push through barriers in business. And you know, mm -hmm. that happens to everybody. It's not like you're the only person that's getting kicked in the face. Like, I mean, I've had crazy shit happen to me in real estate. I mean, it's just, it's inevitable. You've had crazy shit happen to you. It's, it's a business that is highly emotionally charged. And when you're working with distressed sellers, there's a lot of the times there's a reason they're distressed. There's care going on. Like there's crazy shit. Like it's just, you can't make it up. I mean, I've been in houses where like, I could not believe someone was living here. There's a house I'm selling right now in New Windsor. There's like spray paintings of devils on walls. And like, it's so bad. Like you can't even yeah. go in this house. It's like literally falling over. Like. People are living there, unfortunately. And it's sad to wow. say that and see that, yeah. but yeah, it's sad. is what it is. Like you get paid in this business to solve problems and the better you are at solving problems and creating value, more money you're going to make. So as we start to tie the show together and wind down, what does your business look like today? Because obviously you've like blew your income up through the stratosphere compared to where you started. And obviously you're just going to keep getting better. Yeah. So you're right. And basically never giving up was just the thing that, you know, I, I just never stopped. I just never, ever, ever, ever stopped. And, you know, people see, you know, see guys like you and people on all these big podcasts, they think, oh, they must have, you know, have it all together and they don't run into any adversity. Like, no, it's hard. Like it's tough. And you just keep going, you know, you can have a bad day and not be productive. You know, every day isn't a 10, you know, but just never stopping. I think that's just the big difference with me is just I never stop. And today, so basically when I started, I started, yeah, so March 2020, it's the end of 2023 right now. So my first full year, I made 65K. That's better than a sharp stick in the eye. I'll be honest with you. I mean, that's like the normal accounting job when you just get out of college. I mean, that's not bad. Your first year. No, that's good. No, it's not. Yeah, it's not bad at all. It's really not. And so I always just want to double it. So then last year, okay, I made 220. And these are gross wholesale spreads. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to, I want to double it. And so this year I got, I'm at 405 this year, 405. And so that's more money really than I ever thought I was ever going to make. But you know, now, it's now like that I'm in it. Dollars, dude. That's a serious amount yeah, of money. Yeah. And what I wanted to say too, is like, now that I've done I'm doing big deals. I don't do a ton of deals. So this year, I think it's only, well, I should, shouldn't say only. I did 11 deals this year. And just, to, so those are big spreads. Yeah. And I did do two that were really small that were kind of just to push through to kind of make the buyer happy because some things happened with it. But now that that's all I see is just big, huge whales. Like that's just all I go after. I, I literally don't see, I'm like, it's not a deal. I, I guess I, I literally don't see them. I don't even pass them up. I literally just don't see them anymore. And so I'm just going after the big juicy deals. And when I know that there's an issue, you know, I just really take my time and understand the other person's perspective and just really, I don't want them to see my perspective until they really see that I'd see their perspective and understand them and kind of them warm up to me. And that's kind of, there's no like voodoo or anything that I do for, for my sales is I just, I just, I'm a really good listener and I hear them out and I understand them. And then that creates space for me to come in and explain why my price is where it is. And not always, not even usually, but sometimes it works out really good. And, yeah. Oh, and, it's, but, it's amazing, dude. It's amazing to see, like, I just did the math. Your average deal size is $36,000. That is yeah. in the upper echelon of wholesalers because, you know, well, New York is a great market where that's, you know, it's expensive. So that helps for sure. But you could do that in North Carolina too, if you wanted to. But the takeaway that I'm getting is you have created a standard through the journey you've gone through in order to mm -hmm. expect a certain result based on a certain effort and investment that's put into it in time and money and whatnot with cold calling. So it is incredible to hear your story and be yeah. able to personally mentor you basically indirectly for the last three years. And obviously it will continue as you grow. Yeah. And it's amazing for me, I guess, in this case, as the teacher to have somebody actually execute at the level that you've been able to execute and then ultimately see those results come full circle. You know, yeah. as someone who has been doing this for a while, like not a lot of people follow the advice I give them, like, because it's mm. hard, right? It's easy for me to say it hard for them to do it because it's not easy. Mm. But just to see the journey you've gone through and what you have been able to build for yourself is crazy. You became debt-free. 
created a lot of cash and, and, you know, freedom in your life. Obviously you got a wife and two kids now, like, you, you know, you can be a good dad and a good husband and you have the ability to drop them off at school and you can set your own schedule. And that's why people get in this business. They don't get in this business to just hoard money. It's what do you do with the money? And obviously you've been a good steward of capital and you started with the right foundation. So it's an honor to call you a friend and a colleague. And it's incredible to see, you know, what you're going to do with the experience that you've built and the momentum you've built and the skills that you've built. And I, I just tip my hat to you if I had one on right now, because it's incredible. So you got to be really proud of yourself and understand that, you know, you're just going to keep that consistency, that momentum up. And uh, if people were inspired by your story, they wanted to, you know, follow you or check you out, you know, what are the best two ways for people to get in touch with you? So you can, you can reach out on Instagram or Facebook. It's capital property buyer. That's not plural. There's no S on the end. So it's Taylor Berg, B-E-R-G. And my phone number is 845-312-4115. So you can reach out to me in any of those ways. Look at that. Given his phone yeah. number on the podcast. Yeah. He's yeah. got elephantitis of the testicles. Yeah. <laughs> <He'll probably bring. laughs> so that's awesome. I would say send the guy a text first for heaven's sakes. You know, nobody answers the phone call live with strange. Unless you're Taylor and you're really good at cold calling because clearly he Maybe. has his callers and sellers answer the phone live because we know he's doing deals. So capital property buyer on Instagram, Taylor Berg on Instagram. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that you gave your phone number out. People can re-listen to that. It's been an honor to have you on the show. What a journey you've been through. And thank you for being a guest on the Real Estate Investing Fast Track. Thanks, Greg. It's been an honor, man. Hey, and if you want to learn how to do big, fat, juicy checks, hit up Greg, man. <laughs> for sure. If you're in the Hudson Valley or Reno or Delaware or San Diego and you have a deal to sell to me, Greg at VelocityHouseBuyers.com. All right, everyone, signing off. Oh.